Now we do the change. Now I'm just going to speak on the origin of life and evolution. This is a technical lecture. With intent, no god, gods, or intelligent designer will be mentioned. Science will be used to critique scientific research. That's it. I'm going to transition now and just show you what can be done with science. And we're going to discuss uh, uh, origin of life and evolution. <clears throat> I've written on origin of life before. I've written on, uh, it's called Enemid Versions of a Synthetic Chemist. That is supposed to be me. You agree to write for this journal and, and they take a picture of you that they get off the internet and they give it to some deranged artist and that's what they reproduce. <laughs> and, uh, um, so if you read that, if you were to just Google my name, James Tour, and inference, <clears throat> these articles would pop up. It's an online journal. It, 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 it's an open source journal, so, so it's free. You can, you can uh, read it right there online. And I talk about the, how hard it is to make the chemicals that are needed for life. You've got to be able to make these four classes of chemicals. You have to be able to make carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. You need those four chemicals. And how hard it is to make those, in, and, and uh, even in the racemic form, how hard it is, but certainly in their homochiral form. So <clears throat> that's a long article. If, if you're a chemist, you'd probably love it if you're a synthetic chemist. If you're not a synthetic chemist, you can read the beginning and the end, but the middle, if you're ever suffering from insomnia, it'd be a great article to pick up. I've written another shorter article that's a much easier read which was an open letter to my colleagues. This published a, a few years ago, a, a few months ago, just about six months ago, where I talked about how hard it is if you had all the chemicals of life to construct a cell. How would you construct a cell? How would you be able to construct a cell? How would you be able to do this? How do these things come together? Because you have to build a cell in order to, to have life. And the simplest cell requires 256 protein coding genes. How would you construct such a thing? And so I just build those arguments there. So a lot of what I'm saying today you can get from those two articles. But also I'm going to be coming out with another article in a few months which summarizes a lot of the things that I will say today as well. So what is the origin of life? So this is a cell. A cell is an absolute factory. <clears throat> a cell, so much is taking place. It is not just a blob of protoplasm. So, for example, you go into a factory today, and you look in a factory, <clears throat> and you want to say, how do they pick up some material, and they move it from this part of the factory to that part of the factory? How's that done? And you'll see many overhead conveyor belts with baskets of machine parts riding in them from one side to the other. Cell does the same thing. It wants to transfer something from point A to point B. It builds a tubule. <clears throat> builds it, and then materials get transferred along that tubule, and then you know what it does? It deconstructs the tubule, and then reconstructs it in another part of the cell that needs to transfer materials. You say, why does it do that? Because if it left that tubule in place, the cell would become too rigid and couldn't live. So it deconstructs and reconstructs. It's an amazing machine. You have these mitochondria, which are these powerhouses that, of the cell that just drive the cell along. It has this lipid bilayer. We're just going to look at the simplest of the structures, the lipid bilayer, this outer coating that many people say, well, a cell is just a lipid bilayer with some things inside. OK, you want to say you can make the lipid bilayer? We'll just look at the lipid bilayer. What is the origin of life? So I think origin of life research is retarded. And when I say retarded, that just means slowed. You think of it what you want, but by retarded, I just mean slowed. Origin of life research is a retarded field of science. Little is advanced in the field since the highly touted 1952 Miller-Urey experiment. After two-thirds of a century, the world is no closer to generating life from small molecules, or any molecules for that matter, than it was in 1952. One could argue that origin of life research is even more befuddled now than it was in 1952 since more questions have evolved than answers. Since we understand much more about the cell, it's made us realize that we're further from having a cell. Consider what's happened in the last 66 years, two-thirds of a century, since the Miller-Urey experiment in other fields. We have human space travel, satellite interconnectivity, DNA's, DNA's code, and the ability to precisely manipulate the G DNA sequence. We can even now pull out single bases and replace them, as well as strings of bases. 
<clears throat> all of silicon technology, integrated circuits, the internet, that name's just a few in the last two-thirds of a century. What's happened in origin of life research? Nothing. No advances have occurred in origin of life research that have taken us any closer to understanding how life was made. If anybody tells you that scientists understand how life was made, they are lying or they are ignorant. They just don't know. And I'll show you that today. By the way, how many people in here are synthetic organic chemists? Organic chemists. How many organic chemists in here? Okay, so we have one professor here. We have a graduate student. And there, was a, there must be another graduate student. Another one. He told me he was going to come. Where's that other graduate student? Did he not show up? He told me he was going to. Well, anyway, we got two organic chemists here. If I say anything that's not true, just raise your hand or shout it out that I'm lying. You guys got to hold me accountable here to make sure that I don't tell something to these people that is not true regarding chemistry, okay? So chemistry itself is utterly indifferent to whether anything is alive or not. Organisms care about having nucleic acids, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, the four classes of chemicals needed for life, along with redox potentials across membranes and metabolic pathways, standing in exquisite yet ill-defined non-equilibrium states that we call life. While organisms exploit chemistry for their own ends, it is erroneous to expect chemicals to assemble themselves into an organism. Origin of life research keeps attempting to make chemicals needed for life and then to have those assemble towards something for which they are inherently indifferent. We explore here two main classes of origin of life science. First, the prebiotic-like chemicals, the synthesis of the molecules that constitute the, the four frameworks of life, carbohydrates, amino acids, lipids, and nucleic acids. Then the second thing we'll look at is, is how we deal with assembly. How does origin of life research deal with assembly of those into vesicles that they call protocells? Every chemical synthesis experiment, chemical synthesis experiment in origin of life research can be summed up by this protocol, something analogous to this. You purchase some chemicals generally in high purity from a chemical company. You mix those chemicals together in water in high concentrations in, or in a specific order under some set of carefully devised conditions in a modern laboratory. You obtain a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, or lipids. Then you publish a pa paper making bold assertions about origin of life from those functionless crude mixtures of stereoscrambled intermediates, much like Miller did in 1952. Then you engage with the ever-gullible press to dial up the knob of unjustified extrapolation. Then you watch the mem mesmerized layperson exclaim, you see, scientists understand how life formed. Then you encourage a generation of science textbook writers to make colorful, deceptive cartoons of raw chemicals assembling into cells, which then emerge as slithering creatures from a prehistoric pond. Everything can be summed up in that, some permutation of that. But scientists do not understand anything more about life's origin than they did before they performed their experiments, because there is no solution to the fundamental questions needed for the path to life. So how can the papers be published? Well, because origin of life researchers serve as the unbiased reviewers of each other's papers, and <clears throat> and the <clears throat> excuse me, and the uh, the uh, the editors have become numb to all of this. <clears throat> they've seen this over and over again, but they they become numb to it. So you go two thirds of a century with little change in origin of life, and yet other fields make quantum steps leaps ahead for humankind. Here's a brief listing of some of the hurdles which need to be considered when dealing with chemical synthesis experiments common to all origin of life protocols that are being published. Organic chemists understand this. Professor, you will understand this. You will understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Molecules that compose living, system, almost, living systems almost always show homochirality. That means you have one, hand, one mirror image over the other. Nobody has ever offered a demonstrative solution. And if this can be done sufficiently well in a mindless prebiotic cesspool, why cannot the experts in origin of life research replicate it in 66 years of trying while using their sophisticated modes of synthetic ingenuity?
When building molecular systems, constant redesigns are needed which take the synthesis back to step, step one. It's often impossible to remove a moiety once it's been added to a molecule. So in other words, say you're going along and you want to build a cell. Now remember, this is nature which is mindless, has no brain. It's going along and uh-oh, it added a methyl group here when it never should have. Oh, well, I'll just take that methyl group off. You can't. Sometimes it's very hard to take that methyl group off. You add the thing on, you can't get it off. Synthetic chemists today don't know how to get it off. So it has mindless nature. You say, well, an enzyme did it. No, remember, this is pre-enzyme. This is prebiotic. There are no enzymes. We have to make all of this, ab initio, from scratch. That's what prebiotic means. The synthetic reactions do not know how to stop their current course of progression or why to stop. The prebiotic system will continue to make derivatives. You say, ah, I've got the nucleic acid. I'll stop there. I'll take it. I'll put it in the freezer and wait for the next thing that I have to do with it. No, nature doesn't have that advantage. If it made something, it doesn't stop. You're going to continue to react. Time, although claimed to be the great savior of abiogenesis, can actually be the enemy. For example, carbohydrates are kinetic products. They, there's caramelization, meaning they polymerize. Or the Kenazera reaction takes place, where you get, you, you get <clears throat> formaldehyde will oxidize to carbonic acid, while, while, while the aldehyde of the sugar you've just made gets reduced to the alcohol. So in other words, time is the enemy of organic chemists. What do organic chemists do? They make something, they right away want to work it up, and they put it in the freezer and wait for it to be the next step. Why? Because it goes bad. And remember, these things are going to have to wait around for thousands or millions of years in order for the next step to take place. And they're not in a freezer, isolated from, 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 from all the elements. When you're making a kinetic product, time is not an advantage, it's an enemy. A prebiotic system does not have the ability to easily purify the structures. Sometimes selective crystallization can occur with designed input of a synthetic chemist, but most often, not even then. It's hard to purify things. When you don't purify things, what happens is the impure compounds take up the precious starting materials, and you get a mess after a few steps of propagating batches of impure material. That's why chemists work very hard to purify. In fact, it usually takes longer to purify a reaction than it does to run the reaction. Reagent order is critical. What if I said, let's bake a cake today, and so we'll, uh, we'll take the icing and we'll mix it in with the eggs. No, 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 no. The icing has to go last. Well, what's the difference? It all gets in there at the same time. No, we understand. That doesn't work. Organic chemistry is very specific. If you don't add things in the right order, it just doesn't work. The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light or no light, pH, atmospheric gases or no gases, all of that has to be addressed. There has to be a careful structure to all of this synthetic chemistry. No explanation is offered in origin of life research. The characterization at each step is essential for the chemist. We will spend sometimes vast amounts of time trying to characterize our material, because if you have the wrong structure as an intermediate, then you're carrying on a wrong structure. It's going to mess up everything down the line. Well, how does nature characterize anything? It doesn't. In natural biological systems, everything is characterized. Everything is made, and an enzyme comes down and checks if it's the right thing. If it's not, it has ways to degrade that. But in a prebiotic system, before there's an enzymatic world, there's no way to get rid of these things. There's, there's no way to characterize what materials are. You can spend months characterizing a complex molecule. The mass transfer problem is it's just the mass transfer problem will be the killer of all roots. How does one bring sufficient material through a complex multi-step synthesis? There's no accountability of mass transfer from going from one paper to the next. A prebiotic world would never have such a luxury. Nature never keeps a laboratory notebook. You say, well, you know, I'm going along I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the carbohydrate structure that I want, but I've run out of starting material. Well, what do you do in a lab? You go back and you make some more, and you bring up more, it's called bringing up more material from the rear. Well, what happens in nature? Once you bring up more material, it's like, uh, it just cost me 400 million years to get to this point, and I'd like to go back and make some more, but I forgot to keep a laboratory notebook. I don't know how I did that. It has no idea how to go back and make more. You try to go through a 30-step synthesis of making something without going back to the beginning and starting again. What kind of tonnage of material you need to go through multi-steps in a mindless prebiotic environment? All of those are problems.
Professor, aren't those problems? It's hard to do, isn't it? All right. Origin of life synthesis is still miller urey like where you, you, you just make a bunch of compounds and you claim you've done something, except that the research today has put far more precision into the protocols to make more elaborate arrays of stereoscrambled intermediates. One could easily argue, therefore, that the researchers are moving further from the heart of abiogenesis since they are filling the protocols with the best of their intellectual training to coax molecules into the form that the researcher desires. And even with all that intellectual input, Origin of life researchers overcome few, if any, of the barriers noted on the last page. At least miller urey took some simple compounds, passed them across a, a large voltage gap, and saw some scrambled amino acids. At least that was simple stuff going on in there. Now the really elaborate experiments, and still they get very little. This explains the retarded state of origin of life research. When the obvious problems are unaddressed, the researchers will continue down the wrong road while other fields progress toward the benefit of humanity. In addition to the chemical synthesis that does not traverse the hurdles, there's a second part. It's how do you assemble these? How do you assemble structures? So even if I gave you all the chemicals, say you had them all, all of these four classes of compounds, how do you assemble that? There's very few people in the world that actually do organic synthesis and they'll then take those compounds that they've assembled and build it into a higher, work, higher order working structure. It's generally people with an organic synthesis background that work in an area of nanotechnology and the number of people is nano size. It's very few. But we realize how hard it is to build a working system. How do you put these molecules together to do something functional? They will call this a protocell. A protocell by definition, Wikipedia definition, is a protocell is a self-organized, endogenously ordered, spherical collection of lipids proposed as a stepping stone to the origin of life. So some people say if you can get the lipid, then <clears throat> you're part of the way there. Well, remember, a lot of these things just automatically self-assemble, but is that, that, that uh, liposome that's been made, is that really like a cellular lipid bilayer? We'll take a look. Most so-called protocell assembly experiments in origin of life research can be summed up by a protocol like this. You purchase homochiral diacyl lipids from a chemical company, or you synthesize stereoscrambled lipids from smaller molecules. Add those lipids <coughs> to water <coughs> and observe the simple and expected thermodynamically driven assembly of those lipids into a synthetic bilayer vesicle upon agitation. Then often it has to actually go through shear in order to make the vesicles. Sometimes the researchers will add other molecules like nucleotides that get engulfed by the vesicle as it forms. You publish a paper claiming that synthetic vesicle is a protocell and suggestive of early forms of cellular life, engage with the media, watch the lay person be misled. I'm going to read to you from a 2017 article from Harvard University where they, from the Origin of Life Institute there. <clears throat> and and, and, uh, and, and here, here's what it says. Here's a recent example where they're, where they're trying to construct a cell or just have something to do with the construction of a cell. In 2017, researchers from Origin of Life Initiative at Harvard University performed a known type of polymerization reaction in water called reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer, RAFT, which is not seen in nature. It's a purely synthetic reaction. The monomers were all synthetic and unnatural. This is standard chemistry used to make polymers where there, wherein there's a controlled radical polymerization reaction that can afford a polymer chain bearing a hydrophobic block attached to a hydrophilic block when two different monomer types are used. The researchers observed these to form polymeric vesicles during the polymerization, which is expected, nothing new here. While they kept the radical chain growing through ultraviolet light activation, which is a typical activation source, the vesicle grew, consuming monomer within the vesicle, to the point where the vesicle will burst. Again, nothing surprising here. A critical vesicle size is reached, then the forces between the growing vesicle and the surrounding water dictate a critical growth volume before competing forces, forces cause ve vesicle rupture. The vesicle moves toward the ultraviolet light, likely because of heat gradients induced by the light source of reaction thermodynamics. Chemists like myself find this interesting. None of you find this interesting. I find this interesting. That's interesting. It should have stopped there. Here's what they wrote in the article. Quote, the observed net oscillatory vesicle population grows in a manner that reminds one of some elementary modes of sustainable, while there is food, 
population growth seen among living systems. The data support an interpretation in terms of microscale self-assembled molecular systems capable of embodying and mimicking some aspects of simple extant life, including self-assembly from a homogeneous but active chemical medium, membrane formation, metabolism, a primitive form of self-replication, and hints of elementary system selection due to a spontaneous light trigger, triggered by Marigoni instability, which is surface tension gradients. <clears throat> that is a wild statement based on what they did. How was this permitted? Where were the reviewers? Where was the editor? Just because A reminds one of B does not make A a simple form of B. If those little vesicles remind me of flying saucers, it doesn't make them simple or extant flying saucers. The Harvard Gazette then writes an article on this. Uh, quote, a Harvard researcher seeking a model for the earliest cells has created a system that self-assembles from a chemical soup into cell-like structures that grow, move in response to light, replicate, and exhibit signs of rudimentary evolutionary selection. Huh? How is that claim? But nothing of the sort was accomplished in this experiment. The public is deceived. Has the Origin of Life initiative at Harvard fulfilled its mission for the year's requisite publication number? Here's a listing of a few challenges that need to be addressed when dealing with just the lipid bilayer assembly experiments common to most Origin of Life protocols that are being published. Researchers have identified thousands of lipid structures in modern cell membranes. It's not homogeneous. When making cell vesicles, synthetic lipid bilayer membranes, mixtures of monoacial lipids can destabilize the system. So how are these avoided in nature? Nobody knows. Lipid bilayers surround subcellular organelles, such as nuclei and mitochondria, which are themselves microsystem assemblies. Each of these has their own lipid composition, <clears throat> different from the host vesicle. Lipid bilayers have a non-symmetric distribution between the inner and the outer surface. We don't know how to do that in a laboratory. We have no idea how to do that. None of their protocells show that. Without that being done, the cell, it's not a cell. Protein lipid complexes are required passive transport sites and active pumps for the passage of ions and molecules through the bilayer membrane, often with high specificity. All lipid bilayers have vast numbers of polycarbohydrate appendages, known as glycans. These are essential for cell regulation. For example, just six repeat units of the carbohydrate D-pyranose can form more than one trillion different hexamers through branching, which is constitutional, and glycosidic, which is stereochemical diversity. And these branching patterns store more information about the state of the cell than both DNA and RNA combined. You can have more combinations just from the glycan of information stored in those structures than you can in all of DNA and RNA. Every cell membrane is coated by the complex array of polysaccharides, and all cell-to-cell -cell interactions take place through carbohydrate participation on the lipid bilayer membrane surface. Eliminating any class of carbohydrates from an organism results in its death. So how do or origin of life researchers address the prebiotic synthesis of complex lipid bilayers? They don't. Yet they claim a protocell, and origin of life research remains retarded.